Amid the global push towards carbon neutrality, Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine and supply chain uncertainties, the word energy security has become a key word that's become more important for countries everywhere. And in response to these challenges, the Korean government, for one, is aiming to set a new energy policy goal to procure sustainable and accessible sources of power and, of course, better accomplish carbon neutral goals. This largely involves the expansion of nuclear power to diversify the country's energy mix and turn the industry into a major export sector. Now we discuss the opportunities and challenges ahead for nuclear power in the global market. And for this, I'm joined by Samantha Gross, Director of Energy Security and Climate Initiatives at the Brookings Institution. She is also a Fellow of Foreign Policy, Energy Security and Climate Initiative at the University of Chicago. And joining us in Seoul is Ho Gyun Yeo, Professor of Nuclear Emeritus Professor of Nuclear Engineering at Seoul National University. Very warm welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us today. And well, my first question goes to you, Dr. Gross. Now, we're seeing the ongoing invasion, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, very unfortunate circumstances. And it's really making countries around the world rethink their energy policies. And well, how has Russia's invasion of Ukraine really changed uh, government's approach to energy security? I think governments were in past years more focused on the energy transition and thinking about how to reduce the carbon in their economies. Energy security never went away, however. In fact, the energy transition is over the longer term a solution to many energy security problems because renewable energy and to a lesser extent nuclear energy aren't as involved in these geopolitical challenges that we're seeing today. But you're certainly seeing governments think more about energy security and how to achieve an energy transition in a world where fossil energy looks less secure than it did just a few months ago. And Dr. Lee, now in South Korea, uh, President Yoon suk yeol he's been pushing for more nuclear power generation and he's aiming for 30% by 2030. But when you compare that level, though, to countries like France, it's actually not that much. So do you think South Korea should be aiming for a greater expansion in the future? Yes and no, because uh, France is a little bit exceptional case in the sense that uh, their electricity production is based upon nuclear power generation to the extent of almost uh, three quarters, 75 percent. I think it's a little too much, but uh, 30 percent by 2030 seems to be as high as is uh, reasonably achievable, but it can go up to probably more than 30 percent, maybe 33 or even 34 percent because of the advance in nuclear technology. And if we take our uh, development in terms of generation four, the percentage might go up as high as 40 percent. And if we think about nuclear fusion, then it might be as high as uh, 50 percent. And the rest of it should be filled with the uh, basically renewables and um, oil and gas, if you like, or not, because uh, oil and gas should be in there as far as it's backed up by carbon storage and utilization system. And also renewables are pretty much viable because it could be backed up by the energy storage system. So basically three pillars. Uh, renewables, oil and gas, as well as nuclear. That's going to be a very good combination of energy portfolio. All right. So as uh, Dr. Sa just mentioned, diversifying the energy mix is vitally important. And well, Dr. Gross, securing sustainable access to energy, though, that's, of course, crucial as well, as we've seen in recent months, particularly in uh, in Europe. And well, what makes nuclear energy the most uh, attractive option at this point for many governments? Well, there are many attractive options. Um, an important part that makes nuclear attractive is that it's available all the time. Um, wind and solar are only available when it's windy or when it's sunny. And so an important part of decarbonizing the electricity system globally will be finding ways to store that energy so that it's available um, when it's not the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. But nuclear provides that baseload of power that's available all the time, and that can be very, very valuable in a power system. And that's something that makes nuclear attractive. You'll see it play differing roles in different countries um, because of the level of technology that they're starting with and also because of the attitudes of local people in many countries. But it can certainly play that baseload role that's more difficult for some of the other low power, I'm sorry, low carbon technologies. 
I see, and Dr. Gray as well, many tend to think that nuclear energy is just basically bad for the environment, probably because of the word nuclear, I suppose. But how big is the carbon footprint for nuclear energy compared to other means of non-fossil fuel energy production? You know, nuclear power is much lower than all the forms of fossil fuel production, including natural gas, which is the lowest emissions of any fossil fuel. How it compares to other low carbon technologies like hydroelectric or wind or solar depends a lot on how each of those sources is manufactured. The emissions come not in generating the power, but in building the solar panels or building the nuclear plant and mining the uranium. And so it depends very strongly on the kind of energy that goes into all those sources and into that manufacturing. However, they're orders of magnitude lower than fossil fuels. And so we should think about all these together, not as zero carbon because nothing's zero carbon, but it's much, much lower and better than the fossil fuel system that we have now. I see, and Professor Ha, now the government's trying to uh, expand Korea's capacity to develop and export uh, small modular reactors. And well, how do you see the potential there? It's a great question because uh, actually, just to tell you the truth, Korea used to be the first country to uh, certify the standard design of the small modular reactor, which was called a SMART, uh, which literally meant system integrated modular advanced reactor technology. I think it was almost 10 years ago. But then again, the last administration, we sort of lost five years. But at the same time, we were lucky enough to be able to export uh, smart, I think it was two units to Saudi Arabia. And it's essentially an integrated model and it's producing basically 300 megawatt thermal power, a third of which is used to generate electricity, and part of it is to be utilized in basically desalinization actually desalination of the seawater to produce fresh water. And the electricity was good enough to supply probably 100,000 households. So it was a good start, but then again, we lost five years, and in the meantime, the United States and the United Kingdom came along and then they are pushing very hard for these small model reactors. So I think we've basically lost the edge as far as the leading technology is concerned, but we still have a hope to be able to make it back one of these uh, years. Well, the five lost years were indeed very unfortunate in my opinion as well, uh, Professor Hart mm -hmm. as well. Uh, in, in terms of other nuclear technology, though, how is South Korea performing in developing a world-class fusion reactor, the K-Star? I've actually had the uh, chance to see it myself, and very exciting stuff. And well, how is this really going to uh, benefit the country? K-Star, which literally means Korea Superconducting Advanced Reactor, as I recall it. And just by coincidence, it was, I think, three weeks ago, they achieved the temperatures of uh, 100 million degrees C, which is about seven times hotter than the core of the sun. Can you believe it? And it uh, durated actually 30 seconds. So this was like a kind of a milestone achievement. And the important thing about this was that uh, this was the first time in history of nuclear fusion. And that brought us a step closer to commercializing nuclear fusion. Of course, it will come probably three decades from now. And there's a famous saying that nuclear fusion is always three decades away. So if we take current time into consideration, it will be 2052, by which time I'll be gone from here to eternity. So your guess will be as good as mine. Well, there's a lot of developments to look forward to there. And while, uh, while, the country, while many countries are looking to develop their uh, nuclear energy capacity, uh, Dr. Gross, the issue of uh, nuclear energy, it always does tend to bring up uh, you know, the unfortunate a accidents that happened at Chernobyl and Fukushima as well. And, while, while, and now we're having quite a lot of concerns about the uh, nuclear plant in Zaporizhia in Ukraine. And well, can anything really be done then to prevent or at least minimize large scale disasters from occurring in any country, for instance, greater international oversight? 
You know, I think what's happening now is scientists are designing reactors that are inherently safer than some of the ones that came in the past. If you look at the accidents that happened um, horribly at Chernobyl or also at Fukushima, what you see are some important design flaws in those reactors, in addition to some mistakes in how those reactors were run. And the idea of next generation and ongoing new reactor design is to design reactors that fail, that if they fail, they should fail, they fail into a lower energy state. They're inherently safer. And so that's a really important way to harness the power of nuclear energy without having it be so dangerous. Um, even with what's going on in Ukraine at the Zaporizhia plant, I should say, this is not um, a possibility for another Chernobyl, as I've often seen in the news. It's a much more modern reactor that lacks the design flaws that the Chernobyl plant had. And while it's a scary and daunting situation, this is not another Chernobyl in the making. Right. And well, Dr. Todd, there are also, of course, concerns about nuclear waste, uh, nuclear waste disposal, rather. And how is South Korea really approaching this issue as it aims to expand nuclear energy generation? Again, it's a great question because uh, nuclear waste is essentially the Achilles heel as far as nuclear power is concerned. And uh, actually, to, just to tell you the truth again, we are not quite decided yet because we do have a facility that can be dealing with the uh, low and intermediate level waste. We're just dealing with basically gloves, hats, work suits, boots, etc. But we're not decided to be able to deal with this hot fuel, which we call used fuel. And we're talking about hundreds of tons of, uh, actually hundreds of thousands of tons of uh, uranium, plutonium, transuranics, and fusion products. So we'll have to wait and see, but uh, it should be determined, it should be decided whether to recycle it or restore it, actually store it somewhere uh, permanently. We do have interim storage, but that's going to be uh, filled up by 2032, within 10 years. So the sooner the better we have to make a decision as to which way to go and we have to be able to come up with a site for waste disposal and just another question to you Professor ha before we go so right now our nuclear energy uh, reactors our production um, it's mostly being exported by a well basically a sort of a state-owned company, right? But um, in the future, in terms of uh, encouraging more innovation in this field and supporting scientists, what kind of further efforts do you think are needed? Actually, um, we would require, they would require a lot of uh, innovation because the current technology is quite not up to date what the current uh, needs are. For example, it takes too much time in terms of uh, construction. It may take five years to even 10 years. But uh, we have to be able to shrink the construction period down to at least uh, probably 36 months, which I'm talking about three years. So it has to be made small. So we have to be looking toward, looking forward to uh, having a economies of series rather than economies of scale. So we have to be able to make small modular reactors in large quantities. I see. Well, um, just before we go, though, uh, Dr. Gross, now, of course, we can't forget uh, Europe, which is facing a very cold winter, it seems, and it, there's a lot of nervousness around how they're going to really procure supplies. And, well, uh, what's your outlook on this? I mean, what would be um, your really recommendation in terms of how these governments move forward? You know, Europe is really facing a crisis right now in terms of natural gas supply. Um, we saw potential sabotage on the Nord Stream pipeline happen just yesterday, but I didn't expect to see a lot of gas go through that pipeline this winter anyway, given the, the supply situation out of Russia. I think the important thing for Europeans to think about is, is conservation and using the, the natural gas that they have and the power that they're generating very wisely. If they have a cold winter in particular, it's going to be difficult to keep everyone warm and have enough gas to keep industry running. And so the key to that is going to be using the gas and the power that they have just as efficiently as they possibly can to get everyone through the winter. Well, there lies the 
challenge really ends well, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed. And well, I'm afraid this is where we're going to have to wrap up our discussion today. Thank you very much for joining us today. It was a privilege to have you on, uh, Dr. Samantha Gross, Director of Energy Security and Climate Initiative at Brookings Institution, and Professor Seo Gyun-yo, Professor, Emeritus Professor of Nuclear Engineering at Seoul National University. It was a pleasure to have you both on the programme. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me again.